school this morning. Another bright, beautiful Sabbath morning here in New York City. We welcome you to Community Worship Center of Seventh-day Adventists. This is the time of our Sabbath school where we take a look at God's Word. We have been studying the Bible. And uh, for this month, this quarter, we have been looking at managing for the Master. How do you manage for the Master? This week, we are studying about beware of covetousness. Oh, that's a big word. Beware of covetousness. Then our memory verse, which is taken from Luke chapter 12, verse 15, from the New King James Version. It's good if we say it together. It says, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Our precious Lord, as we once again open the Bible, we ask, Lord, that you would forgive us of sins, cleanse us, Lord, that as we again study the Bible, we may be clean before the Lord. We pray, Lord, you will bring back to our minds these precious gems that we have uncovered this week as we studied. Bless us now as we seek to review them together. We ask in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen and amen. Beware of covetousness. Beware means be careful, watch out. That word covetousness in God's sight is very, very serious. It is so serious that God put it in his Ten Commandments. One of the commandments says, Thou shalt not covet. Well, what is this covetousness? What, is, what does it mean? And our lesson says, covetousness is an inordinate desire for wealth or possession that really doesn't belong to you. Wealth, position, that really doesn't belong to you, and you have an inordinate desire for it. Well, that now created a problem in heaven. It went all the way back to Lucifer in heaven, covering cherub, the most powerful angel in glory, covering cherub. Coveted the position of Jesus in the Godhead. Oh, when they go away, they, God had to move away from him. You see, the devil covers God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit with his wing. So he hears everything they're saying. But when the time came for God to talk about creating life, putting life in his planet, they moved from his presence and went somewhere and Oh, Lucifer is still there. Said, but how can Jesus go in there and I can't get in there? Oh, that was an inordinate desire that was illegal. And when God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit returned to their chair, the mind reading God was able to look at Lucifer and said, Lucifer, where did that come from in your mind? I created you a perfect being. Where did covetousness come from in your mind? Until this day, that question has not been answered. But it has caused a great controversy between Christ and Satan, which is going on now. A great controversy. And we see it all around us. And it is winding up. So covetousness is serious enough for God to put it in his Ten Commandments and say, thou shalt not covet. 
no inordinate desire that you have no control over. Yes, that's very... Now, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, equates covetousness with some other serious sins. Whoremonger, liar, adulterers. It's in that category. You see how serious that is with God? Inordinate desire that you have no control over. We need that control. Godliness, the Bible says, with contentment is great gain. So we need to be careful of what we desire. Because you don't put an end to it when it starts growing? Yeah. Is this thing called covetousness spontaneous or does it grow on you? Elder, I liked your, um, um, the way you defined it earlier. But, you know, to break it down and make it simple, I mean, um, as the dictionary says, anytime you look at somebody else's, something that belongs to somebody else, and you look, look at it wishing that it could be yours, it's a terrible sin. Whether it be your neighbor's car, whether it be his wife, maybe it be his job, Anything that you look at, it's a serious sin in God's sight. And to get back to the question, yes, it grows on you. Because, because people will, sometimes people will look with that desire, but then after a while, the more they look, the more that desire just grows within you and grows within you. And, and one day, it will explode. I've seen it happen. You know, people who envy others and um, covetousness and you can see the anger on their faces. And the sad part about it is, many people who have this sinful trait, they are the most friendliest people you can find. They would call their, that person their best friend. But in their hearts, this sin is just growing in their lives. Yeah. It starts in the heart. It starts, begins with a thought, actually. And as you think it and allow that thought to grow and expand, then the way you conceptualize it changes. And that's where that trait can come in because you allow it to grow. You allow yourself to linger on it and, and keep thinking about it and wanting what you shouldn't have more and more. So, but it begins with a thought, I believe. So all this thing, uh, we, are, we seem to be concluding that this thing grow on you. It's not an ordinate, not a sudden thing, is it? it grows it's not on overnight. It elders seem to grow and yes. grow and grow on you. And if you do not do something to control it, it will control you. So God says, thou shalt not covet. That's a direct command from God. Well, we have some people in the Bible who demonstrated that covetous problem and uh, we see what happened to them. Achan is the first one. You remember the experience of Achan? God desire that Israel coming back from the promised land, I mean the, from uh, Egypt, going to the promised land. And they came to Ahai, God says, I want you to go over and take that city. God wanted to use the victory at Ahai to impress the nations around that he is God. So he says, you go in there, I am with you. I'll win the battle with you. Now, 
When you go there, you take all that they have, bring it over to the camp of Israel. But Achan says, I have a family. And uh, this gold and silver look good. And where did he bring it to? He brought it to his tent and buried it in the middle of his tent. Cover it over. And the Lord says, Achan, what's that you're doing? He's, because of that, God says, Achan, I am dis disassociating myself from the whole of Israel. Because of what Achan did. He brought disgrace upon God and upon this God's children. We can do that sometimes, can't we? The things we do individually impact the entire family, the entire church, and even the kingdom of God. God says, okay, you have that, uh, it's a family thing. I got to take care of my family. So I steal. And then when you steal, what comes after stealing? You lie right away, don't you? That creates a problem. So we find there, how did God deal with Achan? Achan is lost. As a result of his sin. That's how serious covetousness is with God. Elder, could I ask a question yeah. to the elders? Someone who is, um, have this trait this morning, um, covetousness, what can they do to rid themselves of this wicked desire in God's sight? What can I do to get, my, get rid of it, eh? Well, now, that's a very good question, Elder. Because I note in my study here this week, it says, Godliness with contentment Amen. is great gain. You've got to learn how to live within your means. Don't, it causes it, covetousness causes you to kill one another. But we've got to learn how to live within our means. Amen. Thank you. Well, yes, we do have to learn to live within our means. But I think, as, as, as you alluded to, it's, it's the Spirit of God that can keep us in a place of contentment. Man by nature is greedy and selfish. It's only by seeking God first, as the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. So if we're walking in God's guidance... And his spirit dwells in us. That's where we can have that contentment. God doesn't necessarily want us to be poor and wanting. He will provide for us. But he gives us the spirit of contentment so that we're content with what we have. And when he sees that we're using that wisely, he may give us more. But if we by ourselves, as humans, think that we can achieve contentment, then I think we are fighting a losing battle. We have to depend on God. So as I studied the lesson, I allowed the lesson to take me back to the great controversy. I looked up the meaning of the word covetous. And I also looked at the Ten Commandments. And amongst all of the sins that we consider heinous sins, there's that thou shalt not covet. Mm. We have listed thou shalt not kill, commit adultery, steal, all of these things that if you, if you consider someone who has those traits, our human minds will assign him the title of a horrible human being. But then there's covet. And I asked myself, why was it necessary to include this specific item amongst the commandments? But when we hark back to the, 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 the place where the great controversy began, so just to take us back a little further, I would dare say that Judas, from his vantage point, observed Jesus' position and decided that, why not me? I should be as entitled as he is. 
I should be able to sit in that place. And I looked up a couple of different meanings of, to covetousness, and it says, one of the meanings says, having a mark, having or marked by an eager and often selfish desire, especially for material positions, possessions. And then the second meaning that I, I saw said, a painful awareness of another's possessions or advantages and having a desire to have them too. So there was Lucifer. There was Lucifer observing Jesus and going, why not me? Why not me? And it started in his heart. And then this, les le this, this lesson brings us, highlights Judas Iscariot sitting. Jud Judas actually had the privilege of walking and talking with Jesus every single day, getting to know him personally, getting to understand his every being. This is who this man is. This is what our Jesus is like. And Jesus showed him every example of right. And Judah sat and decided, who does he think he is that he deserves this treatment that he's being given? Uh -huh. Mercy. Yes. Who does he think he is? Mm. And why should he have it? That's a very powerful point, Elder. And I'd like to go back just a minute before I come back to Judas to talk about a powerful point that a pastor brought up in regards to Akon. Now, and this is something that we should consider in families. If you see your spouse doing something wrong, the onus is on us to tell that spouse, you are doing something wrong. Stop it right now. Do not conspire with the spouse, husband or wife, to go and do wrong. Akon's wife had the opportunity to get it right. Okay, they called her in. She had the, well, first of all, she was in the house with Akon. She should have told him, that's wrong. Let's stop it now. Don't join him. After he died, they called her in. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, they called her in. Anderson Sophia, sorry. Yes, they called her in, yeah. and she had the opportunity to get it right. But she still lied. You see, and that sends a powerful lesson to us, as I said earlier. In families, you know, we have the opportunity, if a husband is doing something wrong, correct him. Or if the wife is doing something wrong, correct her. But don't conspire. Well, what if he won't listen? Well, if they don't want to listen, tell them, you go and do that by yourself. But I am not right. going to sin against God <laughs> and right. in heaven. All right. That, 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 song, that sounds like Mrs. Uh... Sophia. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, sir, for that. But then we're looking at Thank this you. point here at Judas. Yes. Judas came in there. He, he carried the money bag all the time. Every day he would be taking some of that money out. But then here is Mary in complete repentance. Washing Jesus. It's worked for a whole year to get that jar of spike nard, that cologne. And they couldn't hide it because once you put it on your feet, it smelled the whole room up. Caught Judas' attention. Why couldn't you have sold that thing for 300 pennies so that we could give it to the poor. Was it because he was concerned about the poor? Judas loved the poor so much that he wanted to uh, don't do Jesus any favors. That, give me that, um, that 300. That's, uh, our study says that's less than what he sold Jesus for. And sold Jesus for twenty dollars. Like I like like I said earlier, Judas is sitting there going, Who does he think he is? <laughs> Why? Why is she doing this? 
What did he do to deserve this? And that money, all that money she spent on this thing that she's doing, we could have used it someplace else. I, I think, I think he, he, he said, even though he said that, I don't think his concern was really about the cost of the, of, of the perfume. I think his concern was more about the money that he could get some of. Because as we go further in the lesson, we see that he was dipping into the money bag. Okay. And, um, and, and I think that covetousness was listed here among the, the commandments because that was the original sin as was brought out. If I, if I, uh, if I covet your, your car, I might steal it. So covetousness leads to a, a lot of, you know, it's, it's, it's a ripple effect. If I, if I, if, if I like your wife, I go after her. Then after yeah. that, I commit adultery. Then I commit adultery, you find out. You kill me. And, and yeah. so it, it keeps going. One leads to the other. Yeah, one leads to the other. Yeah. So uh, Lucifer sinned, and now we're here. We're fighting in Iraq. We're yeah. fighting in, in Ukraine. We, we're killing each other. We're doing all kinds of stuff. And I, that's one of the reasons this was listed here. Okay? It may not be uh, physically easy to observe or to see that sin festering in my heart as was pointed out by the brother over here i could be your best friend yet i'm i'm so jealous of what you have that behind your back i'm speaking all kinds of evil about you i'm undermining you i'm doing all kinds of things and so that's the reason this sin is listed here and judas had that in his heart and we saw the result of it he wasn't concerned about the money he, was, he wasn't concerned about Christ. He was concerned about the money. And that's why even when he betrayed Christ, he sold him for, for, for money. So would you say that uh, Judas loved money? <laughs> yeah. He, the Bible says. He loved money? The is Bible a, says. Is you know, there a danger in loving money? I mean loving money. I often told, and I need to repeat it, I saw a young man one time with some American dollar bills in his hand, brand new dollar bill, and he said, Pastor, I love the smell. Some of us love money, just the money itself, not even what it can do for you, but we are in love with money, and isn't that Judas's problem? Well, that he went and sold Jesus down the river for nothing. And, and, and because he was in that place, he felt the need to rationalize it. And, and, and that covetousness can lead us to some very, very dangerous places. In fact, take us down that rabbit hole where, where you know, you get to that point of no return. So now it's this is money she's using that can be used on something else he's stating. But his heart is saying, eh, I can get a little bit more without them noticing. You know. But we rationalize certain of our behaviors. We look at it, and in our minds, it makes sense because we're so busy trying to put it into context. We're trying to make it make sense. But the bottom line is, it starts with a thought and takes us to some very, very dangerous places. And especially when we continue to rationalize it. You yes. Know, we mentioned killing in the commandments. We mentioned stealing. We mentioned all these things. And Judas was willing to exchange that love of money for salvation. Yes, Elder. And, 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 and I'd just like to echo something you said earlier. I mean, it shows that this is something that we really have to pray about. Because imagine, Jesus chose him as one of the disciples. He was in Jesus' presence all the time. And still, he had that unhealthy, wicked desire in his heart because... Unusual opportunity of being with Jesus of the love all of along. Money. What a responsibility. But does it, the Bible says money is the root of all evil? The love of it. Oh. 
It's the love. Uh-huh. Not money. And when we love it so much, Pastor Goff, we tend to rationalize our behavior around it. You know, I'm not going to give my tithes here because they don't use it the way it's supposed to be used. I heard that they did X, Y, Z thing with this money, and that's not what the tithe is intended for. It's supposed to go to this place, and it went there. We tend to rationalize that, you know. But the bottom line is that we have to always remember it can take us to some very, very dangerous places, even to becoming murderers, oh, yes. as in the case of Judas. So as, as you're saying that, a thought occurred to me. The love of money is the root of all evil. And I might love money so much that I don't become a robber. I don't kill you to take yours, but I overwork myself and damage my health. Isn't that possible? Absolutely. 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 And, 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 and then the last lesson always ta also takes us in the Wednesday's lesson to Ananias and Sapphira. Now, when we think about them, there was absolutely no reason for them to make that promise that they made. They didn't have to. Nobody forced them. No one came to them and said, Ananias, Sapphira, you have so much. Why don't you? This was a voluntary decision they made to give what they had. Uh, remember the occasion that caused, you know, that, 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 that created this coming together of minds and sharing, and it was a happy time. We're celebrating here, you know. We've gotten some great revelation. We're in a different place, a different mindset. And we're moving forward in one accord with that mindset. Let's continue celebrating. And I put up his hand. Oh, yeah, I have this piece of land that I would like to sell. And I'll bring the money. And, you know, this is my contribution. And then he walked back on that promise. Once he saw how much the sale of that land yielded, he decided to walk back on that promise. Why am I giving this much to the church? And I could use it for my family. This is too much for me to give to the church. I can use it to buy a new car, a, a new donkey, <laughs> in his case. <laughs> you know, I can use this money to do so many other things. Why am I giving it to the church? That thought led Ananias to decide to cheat God. Because he made a promise. And that promise was to God that I will sell this piece of land and contribute it to the ongoing of your work, God. But once he saw that lump sum money in front of him, all of a sudden the thought process changed and he began to rationalize. And he's looking at what he has and, well, this seems plenty enough to give. Why am I giving 5,000 when 4,000 is just enough? 4,000 will still help them to get to that place. I can use $1,000 to do something else. Go out, have a nice dinner, whatever. You know. Whole year's salary. Jeez. Yes. Oh. Yes. But then the Lord rebuked Judas. Says, Judas, against the day of my burial, has she done this? That's Mary. Look at where she was coming from. Came a prostitute. Good friend of Jesus became a prostitute and now she has repented and she was ready to anoint the feet of Jesus. Judas says that could have been sold for 300 pennies. Mm. That's the, that is what the cross of Christ meant to Judas. Covetousness is serious. For the Lord put it there in his commandments as thou shalt not COVID. Thank you, sis. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for that reminder, uh, Pastor. So we saw, we saw examples of um, Ananias and Sapphira. We saw Achan. We saw the results of covetousness. 
And uh, Thursday speaks of overcoming uh, that attribute or that evil attribute. And uh, I started by a little reading here. It says, covetousness is a matter of the heart. And like pride and selfishness often goes unnoticed, which is why it can be so deadly and deceiving. It's hard enough overcoming sins that are obvious, lying, adultery, stealing, idolatry, Sabbath breaking. But these are outward acts, things that we have to think about before we do them. But to overcome wrong thoughts themselves, that gets tough. And as I said before, the only way we can overcome wrong thoughts, first is not harboring them. Well, first is seeking God's strength to overcome them. The Bible says that uh, God will not give us more than we can overcome. Okay? So, he's, he's not going to allow us to be tempted more than we can be we can overcome, but he's going to provide a way for us to escape. And so moving right along here, um, how then in God's power can we be protected against the dangerous decept this dangerous deceptive sin? So that question is asked, and I know in looking at these lessons, we often look back and think of the people who committed the sins and, and what you would have done in, or I would have done in that situation, but we... We should always bring these lessons home to us. These lessons are not just history lessons of things that happened in the past, but they're here for us to learn from them. And, and so uh, moving right along, uh, there's a list of, of things that we can do to help us overcome this sin. The first one is make a decision to serve and depend on God and to be part of his family. If you're part of God's family, then God is the head of your home. And if he's the head of your home and he dwells in your heart, then you can seek guidance and counsel from him because he's right there with you. And his presence will help you to make the right decisions. So the first thing you need to do is to make a conscientious decision to give your life to Christ and to seek him as your source of guidance. And when you see yourself becoming obsessed with something, when you see yourself uh, pondering over something that you know doesn't belong to you, Turn to him and ask him to give you the strength and the courage to overcome. Spend more time on your knees. And that leads right into the second point. Be daily in prayer and include uh, Matthew 6, 13, which says, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Here we see that if we spend time in prayer, we may not have enough time to, to ponder on the things of our neighbor. And not only that, this, uh, this text tells us, for thine is the kingdom and the power. God has the power and he has the ability to give you what he thinks is good for you. So you of yourself may see something and think it's good for you. And God does not provide that to you because he knows it's not good for you. But within your heart, you start obsessing over it. And the next thing you know, you're doing all kinds of evil acts to get that. Friends, we need to spend more time in prayer. And we'll spend less time coveting. Amen. Third, it says, be regular in Bible study. And it goes on to say, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Studying God's word, we'll see that Christ was tempted in all things like as we are, yet was without sin. And the way he was able to, to, to stay strong in the midst of sin was to always be in communion with his father. If we spend time, more time communion, communing with God, he will give us the strength to overcome these things. Moving right along. Well, let me read what it says here. Jesus tackled the human sin problem. He was tempted on every point that we were tempted on and for power to resist. He spent whole nights in prayerful communion with his father. And Jesus didn't leave this earth until he had both forged the way by example and then promised power to make it possible for every person to live a life of faith and obedience, to develop, to develop a Christ-like character. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 
Christ knew that Judas was going to betray him, yet he kept him close to him. He knows that we will sin and we have sinned, but yet he keeps us close to, close to him. He wants to give us an opportunity to repent, to come back to him, to seek him as the source of our providence and the source of our strength. And so he, he keeps us close to him. It's up to us, just like Lucifer was close to him, but he made a conscientious choice to turn away from God. Don't let us be uh, guilty of that same sin. We are here, we've seen all these examples, learn from them and let us draw closer to Christ so that we can have the strength to overcome this. Excellent, Elder. And, and also on a practical level, after we have done all these things, spend time in daily prayer, spend time in Bible study, keep our eyes of what we are envying. If you, are, if you look at your neighbor's car and you're covetous towards it, take your eyes off the car, look at something else. If you're looking at your neighbor's wife, when she passed her in the other way, let her go that way. Because the more you see, it comes back in your thought. And the more you think about things, the more it grows. So whatever you're looking at, at it and it's causing you to sin in God's sight, turn your head the other way and look at something else. So you're mind. saying this thing is a mind, is a mind matter? It's a mind thing, Elder. Yes, the more we ponder, the more it grows. I also wanted to include um, 1 Corinthians 10, 14 that says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry because we can take our possessions and things and create idols out of them. And that's what takes us down the rabbit hole. When we've put them in such a place of honor in our hearts that every action is directed at achieving that thing, that possession, or keeping it. So, so that ties in with the original sin because Lucifer wanted the praise and the honor. And so anything that uh, we spend so much time exalting and obsessing over, we're making that an idol as well. Hmm, interesting. Friends, we have, we have a lot to do in terms of, of gaining the power that's available to us to overcome these things. The Bible says if your eyes offend you, pluck it out. Now, if you find that every day you, are, you, you leave to get to work at, at 7 o'clock to get the bus, and your neighbor's wife leaves at 7 o'clock. Or husband. And, or husband. Yes. And, 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 and you see that, that walking to the bus together is leading you down the path of unrighteousness. You either need to start taking a different bus. Yes. Or maybe you need to... Huh? Leave earlier, leave, earlier. <laughs> yes. leave later, or maybe even move from there because you're finding, you're walking the, the path that yes. can only lead to destruction. Causing you to sin, yes. Now, I use that example, but it could be anything. Yes. You know, we spoke of, you, of the car next door, you know. Um, does that mean that if I'm, uh, if I'm walking down the street and I see a nice car going by, I'm like, oh, man, that car is nice. I should get one of that. Does that mean um, I'm coveting? No, 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 no. I mean, to see something and just give a compliment and move on, you're not sinning. But if, if it's your friend's or your neighbor's car and you want to kill him to get that car, then that's a sin. Well, I don't want to kill him. I just want to steal it. <laughs> yes, it's the same thing. The same Covetousness, thing. yes, yes. You yes. want to do something um, that's sinning so, against God to get what's not yours. Yes. Okay, an inordinate desire for something that's not yours. Okay, um, being highly motivated is different to an inordinate desire for something that someone else possesses. Definitely. Okay, you can be highly motivated to, to, to achieve educational success or success on the job. But when that, on the other hand, becomes your sole obsession, and that's all you focus on, putting aside family, putting aside God, or maybe you keep family, but you put aside God, and all you're concerned about is this job and, and, and moving up in this job. And so I, in, in order for me to get there, I'm now working on the Sabbath because I don't want to turn my boss against me. So now this job is now becoming my, my idol. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. And, yes. and, and I'm losing my salvation because I'm, I'm so obsessed with this job. So, so this business of being covetousness, being covetousness, whatever it is, um, 
covers a lot of areas, and that's, that's why it's included in the commandments. So we need to be careful on how we, how we live this life that we have. You know, God gives us possessions so that we can help others, not so that we can obsess over them and make them our idols and gods. Yes, yes, and Elder, I just want to make a quick, quick point. I know time is of the essence, but just to answer this question, I mean, one of the things that inspired me to go to college was our Adventist elders. elders. They came to a church one Sabbath, and they spoke about West Indies College and education. Mm -hmm. I was inspired. I wanted to be like them. I wanted to get an education. And it took me seven years to reach West Indies College, but I eventually got my degree. The point I'm making is nothing is wrong with bettering yourself. You may see things that may, uh, you know, that may cause something in your heart to just um, trigger you to say, I want to do better. And you want to work to get what that other person has. But the problem comes in when you want to kill or steal or destroy whoever has it to get it. Well, okay, so you're saying because somebody have it, if I want it because he has it. I don't know, well, I guess we can keep this discussion going for a very long time, you know. Obviously, we're visual people. We see things, we want it. But how we want to achieve it and why we want to achieve it is what makes the, is what makes the difference between yes. coveting yes. and just, you know, just wanting something. So you're saying it's not wrong to desire some good things. It's not wrong. It's not no. wrong to desire. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that. Paul says we need to covet some good things. Yeah, huh? that's what I'm saying. But now you've got to be careful what you do with that. Mm -hmm. The elder is saying if, if you go that way, you walk the dog, go the other way. You do something about that inordinate yes. desire. Nothing wrong in desiring something nice, yes. something good. But now don't kill the other person in order to get it. And that type of thing. In the case of uh, Ananias and Sapphira, the elder is saying that it, did the, the wife had to agree with him? Well, in, in, in that culture, that was a male-dominated society. The wife didn't necessarily have to agree, but she did conspire. She went along. But she's gone to hell. Uh, huh? She went along. She could have, she could have said, hey, uh, well, I'm not going to get involved in this. You know, <laughs> Maybe I'm going to talk to the elder about this or something. I've had a situation where on the job, some folks wanted to sell some, some uh, equipment and split the money up. And I'm like, hey, I'm not getting involved in this. <laughs> and they didn't because I stood up. If we all wanted to do it, then they would have done it. Yeah, the question in this phase, this part of the lesson here is, Ananias and his wife decided to give. And they held back. And then they lied. Which one, which one was the worst? Right? The holding back or the lying? Both. <laughs> Both. <laughs> because they made a commitment that we're going to do this thing. They promised the Lord. And then walked back on it, on that, on that promise that they made. And then compounded it by lying. And you notice what Peter, Peter wasn't there with Ananias at home when they saw, but when he came before Peter, Peter says, Ananias, why have you lied? To who? To the Holy Ghost. It cost him his life. He didn't have to do it, but he saw the accolades placed on the ones who gave and he wanted some of that stuff. And he went and sold all he had. And the elder is saying maybe the wife could have saved herself. Huh? <laughs> so wives, you probably can help your husbands out. She went down the rabbit hole with him. Oh, she <laughs> went right down the hole with him, the elder says. God help us to recognize the danger of covetousness. Inordinate desire, one over which you have no, you let your mind go. I got to have it. That person got that, that position, that job. I got to kill that person in order to get there. That dress that lady wear to church, some of you come only to see how somebody is dressed. And you got to have that dress. If you don't have it, you kill somebody to get it. God says it's serious 
enough for me to put it in my commandment. Thou shall not come. But thank God our lesson teaches that there is hope. What is the hope? What is the hope? I see it says godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. All right, next Sabbath we will look into giving back. Giving back, giving back. Study that this week. Father, thank you so much for what we have uncovered this week as we studied the Bible. Bless your children, Lord, as we continue to dig deeper and deeper in your word and understand your will. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you when it, until it is yours to come. We beg in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs>
welcome and thanks for joining us here today at Community Worship Center. Whether it's your first time here or you're one of our returning guests, we are so glad that you decided to worship with us. We pray that something during this service blesses you and brings you closer to Christ. Now, let's join the service that's already in progress. You have come to a place where the living God dwells. He is God of all. Come into his presence with singing and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Come and approach him boldly with confidence through your faith in him. Because of the eternal purposes realized by Christ Jesus, let us bless his name. Let us worship him with our hearts, souls, mind, and strength. God, hallowed be your name. We have come into this place today to worship you. This place is yours. We are your children. This is your day. And we came to give you all the glory and the honor that is due to your most high and holy name. And we invite your Holy Spirit to tabernacle with us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that everything we do will be acceptable in your sight. So as the praises go up, the blessings will come down. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. And standing on the sea of pure glass was a crowd so great it was numberless. Are we going to be there? Let us all plan to be there. On behalf of our pastor and all our officers, we welcome you. And those of you online, come join with us so we can be there for that precious welcome from our Father, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now I beg your attention for a few brief announcements. Our health ministry team will meet immediately after service today. Um, you can see Sister Lastinia Grant if you have any questions regarding that, the whereabouts of the meeting in attendance. And then our Shepherd's Boys Club will meet downstairs in a multi-purpose room, also immediately after service today. And all parents are asked to come for a brief meeting. Brother Corbin and staff will be in attendance. So all parents, the multi-purpose room immediately after service today, all of the boys. 
Our Youth Compassion Ministry will be hosting an outreach program immediately after service on next Sabbath, which is Sabbath, March 11th. They'll be going out into the community, handing out care packages and tracts, and also praying with people. They're also considering going to the shelter to do the same. So everyone is invited to participate in this effort, and if you have any questions, please see Brother Daniel Shaw. I don't know if Daniel's here today. Daniel, stand so they can know who you are if you're here. But please see Brother Daniel Shaw who is the Compassion Ministry Leader, so we can have great participation in that. And our Family Life Ministry will be hosting a parenting workshop on Sunday, March 12th at 10 a.m. And it's open to any parent or non-parent or adult working with children. And registration is required for this event brunch will be provided if you'd like to submit your names you can do so with elder scott channa or elder kevin williams or natalie williams who are the the um, leaders of the family life department or you can register also on cwcsda.org or email your registration information to familylife at cwcsda.org. And there's a flyer on the bulletin board. You can scan that uh, QR code and register that way. Thank you for your attention, and have a blessed day all. Pastor, we have two outgoing transfers to the Maranatha SD Church in Brooklyn, New York, Jasmine Clark, to Kingsborough Temple in Brooklyn, New York, Colin Robinson, Jr. This is the first reading. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm glad to be in the house of God on this beautiful Sabbath morning. Pray and hope that each of you had a blessed week. Uh, this past week, we know there may be some challenges. There may have been some ups and downs along the way, but we have all made it through. Amen. God has blessed our days to roll on just a little while longer. Amen. And we're looking forward to a high time in worship on this day At this time we're going to prepare for our baptism man i thought someone had been excited about that this time we're going to prepare for our baptism we have two souls who are going down into the watery grave of baptism two men somebody say hallelujah amen but before we call these two gentlemen i want to ask as well to see if she's arrived uh, miss stacy riley miss stacy Stacy, can you come? Can you come join me? Hey Amen. We're Stacy is coming in. She is uh, already a member of the household of faith, but she wants to become a member of this body by profession of faith today. Come on, let the church say Amen. So, if you could just join me, Stacy. And so, at this time, uh, before we do the baptism, we want to just officially uh, take a vote in motion. Uh, to accept Stacy Riley into our fellowship here at the Com Community Worship Center. So uh, do we have a motion to accept her into the household of believers? It's been moved, it's been seconded. You ready for the question? Any other questions? All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. All opposed, same sign. It is carried. So Stacy, we welcome you. <laughs> Blessings. And we're going to have a, an official greeting for you shortly, okay? Amen. So we have two gentlemen. We're getting baptized on today. And I'm going to invite a clerk to come to call the names.
Amen. Amen. Is there a motion that we accept him into full membership? CWC per their baptism today. It's been moved and seconded. Ready for the questions? All in favor, let me know by saying aye. All opposed, same sign. It is carried. Amen. We have a young man, Brother Julian, who's coming first. Amen. I see Brother Julian here every Sabbath. Somebody say amen. Amen. And so we're just thankful uh, for Brother Julian. I don't know if you might want to take your shoes off, buddy. But we thank Sister Hamilton has been working with Brother Julian. And Julian, if I know your brother is here, we want to invite any other family and friends who'd like to come. Uh, to support this young man who has given his life to the Lord. I want to invite you to come forward at this time. Amen. So, Brother Julian, because it's your desire to give your life to Christ, to start a walk of faith with him, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. for brother Fitzroy uh, amen amen uh, sister Sandy has been working with him now we know that brother Fitzroy has a testimony if you guys remember not too long ago we announced about uh, someone having a stroke but look how far God has brought him amen from the hospital to the baptismal pool amen and so we praise God. He's Sister Campbell's brother. So we have some family here. Any other family and friends who want to come forward? At this time, we invite you to come. But Brother Fitzroy, we now baptize you. Because of your desire to make Jesus your Lord, to put him first in your life, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Somebody say hallelujah. You know, brothers and sisters, Brother Fitzroy is a testimony. Okay. Man. Brother Fitzroy is a testimony. Like so many others are. That sometimes it's our it's the tragedies we experience in life that lead to our greatest triumphs. And just a few months ago, on the brink of a, a major health catastrophe, but to now be restored to health and also to find his way to Jesus. And there are some others of you here today and some who are tuning in to line, tuning in online. And I want you to know that what you're going through, what you're dealing with, it wasn't designed to destroy you, but to deliver you. So that your great tri tragedy can also become what leads you to your greatest triumph. And so if you're, you're here today and you're going through, if you're tuning in online right now and you're going through and you're still stuck on why, maybe the very reason God is allowing it to happen to you is because he's still trying to save you. And so brothers and sisters, we don't even have to wait to the sermon and appeal because there's someone here now you can choose Jesus in this moment to accept him as your Lord and Savior and before we go any further in this service I want to give you the opportunity to do that on this day to say Lord God I choose you I thank you for choosing me and I want to be in the next baptism if your heart is so desiring today, it can even be on this day. But if you're here, whoever you are, and if you're tuning in online, there's a, uh, you can look in the chat where you can click on the link to make your decision for Christ. But if you're in this place at this time, whoever you are, just raise your hand so we can acknowledge you. Just raise it nice and high, whoever you are. Just raise it. You want your tragedies to be turned in tri into triumphs. Just raise that hand. Will there be one? Let's pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, God, for what Our eyes have seen and our ears have heard in this place. We thank you, God, for the souls who have said yes to you and gone down in the watery grave of baptism. But, Father, we know that there are others. And my prayer, God, is that even now in this place and in homes for those who are watching online and even for those, God, who may not even be watching at this moment, but who are going to tune in to this service later. We're asking that your Holy Spirit would already convict and touch hearts. And as we are living in these last days, God, that decisions will be made for you. God, we in particularly labor for our families, for our children grandchildren, parents, spouses, siblings, uncles, aunts, cousins, friends, neighbors who may still be lost in this world. We especially labor for them now, God. And may we ever be powerful witnesses before them 
of what the saving grace of Jesus has done in our lives. We thank you and we pray this prayer in your holy name. Church said amen and amen. My faith has found a resting place. My faith has found a resting place.
Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord at this time. It's prayer time. We want to ask everyone uh, to remember one of our very own pastors uh, in Northeastern Conference, uh, Pastor Jude Francis, and the family in our prayers. His wife, Carolyn, uh, passed away. Pastor, I believe, Brooklyn Faith uh, Church. The funeral will be on next Sunday, March the 12th. Uh, the viewing will be from 1 to 3 p.m. And the funeral will begin at 3 p.m. at Goshen. So please, let's remember uh, Pastor Jude Francis. I also ask uh, for you to remember today uh, our evangelist, Pastor Patrick Vincent, uh, who was supposed to be here with us on today, but he had some health challenges uh, this week. Uh, and being an older gentleman, he was not able to make the flight and make the, dis the trip here. Uh, had an allergic reaction to a procedure that was done. So let's remember him in our prayers. That's Pastor Patrick Vincent. Uh, we will reschedule a date for him to come uh, to be with us. But I want you to remember him in your prayers today. Amen. Uh, but after service, uh, we will... Uh, Go on with our regular Bible study time at 3 p.m. Uh, today. Let's also remember Sister Reed, who lost her brother, and her husband is sick at this time. Uh, Sister Hollis, we're continuing to pray for her. But now her mother-in-law is ill as well and soliciting prayer. Uh, our own brother Anthony Williams is, uh, is in the emergency room uh, from last night. So let's remember him in our prayers. And Sister Geraldine Lopez uh, is still in the hospital. We want to remember uh, Sister Geraldine at this time as well. Uh, but before we go to prayer, I do want to just invite some very important people, and I'm going to call them in a moment uh, to join me. You know, there's, there's certain ministries in church, in some churches, that, that are oftentimes are never up front. They're never in the spotlight. But their ministries are some of the most powerful in the church. Amen. And one of those such ministries here in our church, and many of you may not know who they are, is our care ministry team. It's all right, you can affirm them. Oftentimes in church, and rightfully so, a lot of ministry focus is specifically on outreach and reaching the lost, which is vitally important. But the care team at CWC was specifically put in place just for in reach. Somebody say amen. amen. To care for our membership here. All of the names I just read to you, I know their situation in this moment because of the care team. Yeah. Oftentimes when you've heard from me or if I visited you at home, in a home or a hospital, it's because I've been informed by our care team. And sometimes when I'm not able to, to reach you or be there or pass the golf, but the care team is an extension of your leadership team. 
and they do such a great job ministering on behalf of this church and they're under leadership of Sister Sandra Freeman and I'm going to invite Sister Freeman to come and I want the entire care team to come just join me uh, right here up front all of the members of the care team don't be shy if you guys can come just line right up front right here And I want you guys to face the congregation. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together and affirm you. They go above and beyond to make sure that we're informed of the needs, the illnesses, uh, the troubles. They're even right now working uh, on ways to reach out to your children and grandchildren who are away at college so, they're, so that they're not forgotten. Come on, somebody say amen. And so I want to just say publicly thank each of you uh, for just the hard work that you guys do just to make sure that we're all informed uh, and the reason I wanted you guys to, to come down, in particular at this time, because it is prayer time. And uh, I know we all have all of our different issues and needs and things that we need God to do in our life. But I want us to just take a moment. Can we pray over our prayer team, our, our care team, who so often is praying for us, who's praying over each of us? Let's take some time to pray over them and so at this time as the praise team gets ready to 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 sing I'm going to invite those who want to just come down closer to be at the altar I'm going to invite you to do it this time we're going to take a moment after the song to pray specifically I want you to pray individually take time to pray over the members of our care team and then I'll pray from the desk in that order can come at this time. Amen. So just at this time, even though you're still coming, coming down to the altar, let's take a moment. I want you to pray silently over the care team. And if you're close by, you can even lay hands on them and just pray over them at this time.
Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for being a God. Who cares? We thank you for being a God who's concerned about us. We thank you for being a God who never sleeps, no slumbers. But is in tune with the affairs of your children. Father, we, in this moment, just say a special word of thank you. Because God, not only do you care, but God, you've ordained certain individuals whose role in the church simply revolves around caring for others. And we thank you, God, for the care team here at Community Worship Center. We thank you, God, for their willingness to be a listening ear. We thank you, God, for their willingness to, to be on the phone day and night, sometimes late in the midnight hour. We thank you, God, for their willingness to always be available. We thank you, God, for their willingness, God, to take time to, to help spread information uh, throughout the church, God, so that we as a body of believers can lift up those who are hurting in need. We thank you, God, for their willingness to sacrifice for the others. We thank you, God, that though they face trials and obstacles of their very own but God they don't allow what they're dealing with or going through themselves to to hinder their ability God to care for someone else and so father we say thank you and we thank you for each and every one of them those who are here and those who may not even be here right now and so father right now as we are surrounding them and even lay hands on them God we pray a special prayer for our care ministry team and we pray God that you would that you would bless them I'm praying God as they care for others God that that you would put a special importance God around their their needs and their issues we know that the enemy wants to discourage them and so father I'm praying that as they pray and lift up and care for our children our mothers and our our grandparents and our spouses and siblings God I pray that you would bring a special healing that you would put a special hedge of protection uh, around their families around their spouses uh, found their around their children around their uh, parents around their siblings God uh, around their family and friends I pray God for a blessing over their family as they seek and call out the needs of others, God, I'm asking that you would intercede right now and move upon all of the needs and the issues and challenges that they're dealing with. And we thank you, God, for their willingness to sacrifice. And we're praying, God, that, that you would open up windows of heaven, God, and pour out blessings, God. But they don't have room enough to receive. Father, I pray that you'd help them to know, God, that even though they may not often be up front, but their ministry, God, is one of the most powerful we have in this church. Uh, we thank you for calling them for such a time as this. And Father, the names they even gave me this morning. Sister Reed and Sister Hollis and Brother Williams and Sister Lopez, God, each with different needs and issues and ailments. We pray for healing. We pray for restoration of health. Father, I pray even for our evangelists. God, the, the enemy will not win. Though our training and program may be delayed but it will come to pass so we give you glory in advance and I'm praying God that you would restore his health right now in the name of Jesus even as we pray father we pray 
and touch and agree that you would comfort God even now, Pastor Francis and his children. As they're mourning the loss of such a beautiful lady. Battle with cancer. God, even as they hurt, we're asking God that you would wipe the tears away. Give them strength as they grieve. Remind them, God, of the hope that this death is not final, but it's only a resting time. Because one day the trumpets sound. And the clouds are going to roll back and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And God, I know that we'll see Sister Francis again. Father, we pray for every member who's come down to the altar. Some who have special needs that we were not able to call out. Some we may not even know exactly. But I'm thankful, God, that you know each and everything that's going on with us. But better yet, you have a solution. So, Father, please move upon all of our situations now. God, we're not telling you what to do or how to do it. Because we know that you know what's best. We're just asking you, God, to move in your appointed time and give us the patience. To wait on you. That's our prayer, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every lover of the risen Christ say amen. Amen. And amen. Freeman, I want you to just raise your hand. So this is Sister Freeman. She's the head of the care ministry team. And I want each of you to just get, take a good look at them to make sure if they do not have your information, please make sure that one of them on this team has your information. 
uh, or that you have there so that if anything ever comes up or there's a situation that arises in your life, uh, that we can be in, that you can be in contact with them, we can be in contact with you so that we can be there for you in your time of need. Amen? Amen. Amen. Whether you're a member or not, if you want to be a part of this fellowship, whether your membership is here or not, we are concerned about you. Amen? Amen. Let's give them another round of applause. The Old Testament reading comes to us from Jeremiah chapter 18, reading from verse 1 through to verse 8. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. The New Testament reading comes to us from John 14. And I'll read from verse 1 to verse 7. John 14, 1 to 7. I'll read in your hearing. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there he may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And my... And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy words. Amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. I do want to just acknowledge at this time the presence of uh, Dr. Lee Croft Green and his wife uh, who are here with us. Let's acknowledge their presence. Uh, Dr. Green will be with us here in a few weeks, uh, breaking the bread of life. And so we look forward to you. We're returning in a few weeks. Amen? Amen? Amen. I do want to, before we lift our morning's tithe and offering, you already know why I'm here. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 What am I holding in my hand? The pledge card. Amen. Amen. You know, myself and uh, Brother Smith, we had another meeting this week. Uh, with some contractors and brothers and sisters, we're moving by faith. Uh, there's some structure, structural work and some needs that need to uh, be uh, finished here in this building. Uh, and our goal is to raise how much? 
man, y'all are getting a little quiet. I want you to say it with confidence, like you believe it's going to happen. Amen. To raise how much? By when? June. Man, every time we, it gets a little less and less. By when? June 1st. Brothers and sisters, I know that we can do this. I know that God has blessed us with every resource that we need. Now it's just time for us to step out by faith. The ushers are coming through the line for those who have not made their pledges yet. On your pledge card, you'll see an amount of 500, 1,000, 2,000, or 5,000. Then there's an other line. We don't want to limit you to one of those four boxes. There may be someone here, there's someone tuning in that could, that could give, that could bless us with 150,000. There's someone who maybe can give 50,000, 10,000, 40, 75,000. What we just need is for everyone to give. Because there's someone here who can only give $75. But that's more than what those some who can give thousands of dollars because it's all they have. What we're asking is that whatever you can do, if you can give it today, whether you're online, you can check on the special project box. Or if you're going to write a check or turn in cash or however, on a tithe envelope, just write in the memo our special project and for those who are not able to give today we want you to just fill out the pledge card and drop it in the offering plate either now or as you leave and raise your hand for those who still need their pledge card and have not filled it out yet and brothers and sisters I believe that God is going to bless us brothers and sisters I believe it's very it's vitally important that there has to be a standard for how God's house looks. How many of you believe that? And so there is some work that needs to be done. There's some work that you have wanted to get done for years now. Now is that time. Uh, so please, on this day, let's walk by faith and not by sight, trusting in God. Amen. As the songs of the old song says, you can't be God-given, no matter how hard you try. Let's try hard today. Let's try hard over these next few months, and let's just see what God's going to do. I believe it. You believe it? Bless you. And offerings, deacons, please come forward. To borrow a bit from our current lesson study, one of our lessons indicates that tithing is important because it helps us establish a relationship of trust with God. To take one-tenth of your income and give it away, though technically it belongs to God anyway, truly is an act of faith. And only by exercising it Will your faith grow? And, and the lesson says the second big reason for financial faithfulness is to access the promised tangible blessings of God as part of the tithing contract. God has promised blessings that are so large we won't have room enough to receive them. With our surplus, we can help others and help to support the work of God with our offerings. Bringing you all the tithes into the storehouse found in Malachi 3.10 is God's command. No appeal is made to gratitude or generosity. This is a matter of simple honesty. The tithe is the Lord's and he bids us return to him that which is his own. Managing for God is a unique privilege and a responsibility as well. He blesses and sustains us and asks for only a tenth. And then he uses his tithe to provide for those in the ministry as he did 
for the tribe of Levi during the time of ancient Israel. And we have provided several means by which you can return. And that information is listed on the screen. Choose whatever one works best for you and please use it. Make a note of it and use it. the tides into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now here with saith the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field saith the Lord of hosts. Dear God, loving Father, God of all creation, provider, we come before you now, Lord, with thanksgiving in our hearts. Thanksgiving for what you have provided to us. And Lord, as we return willingly to you that which is yours and generously give to the furtherance of your work, we ask you now to bless our feeble efforts, dear Lord, so that it might go in precisely the manner it's intended. Continue to guide our hearts. Speak to us, Lord, so that we will continuously walk in your paths of righteousness and do that which is your good and perfect will. And we give you all the thanks and praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Quickly drawing near, but as they prayed for deliverance, the victory would begin. For when we call upon the Lord, we summon all of heaven. Pray on, for you are who the Lord is looking for. Pray. today is dedicated to everyone and anyone who is going through anything whether it's your health whether it's your family whether it's your finances because I know that everybody here if you're not going through something you're coming out of something or you're getting ready to go into something 
but I need you to be reminded that our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Our God is higher than any other. Our God is a healer. Somebody's sick, but our God is a healer. He's awesome. He's powerful. He's wonderful. He is our God, and there is none like him. Do you believe it? So I just need you to help us sing. I need you to help me sing. And I just need you to put everything aside and just raise a praise. Let's raise the roof off of this church. And let's just give the Lord everything we got. Amen.
thank you for being a great God. We thank you for being greater than anything that we're going through. We thank you for being stronger than any battle that we face. And we put you at the center of our lives. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you. Jesus at the center.
say amen. Amen. You're blessed by the ministry of song. Let's worship. We thank you, praise team. Uh, Princess Christoph for using your gifts uh, to glorify God on this day. Again, it's so good to be in God's house. Amen. So good to see each and every one of you. We thank you. All of our leadership team, uh, the elders, deacons, uh, ushers, the floor managers, the media ministry, all those who play a role, our deaconess, all those who just play a role uh, in making sure uh, that you have a pleasant experience when you come here for worship, uh, the sound team, making sure the sound is correct, amen hostess greeting you at the door and so we just thank uh, each and every one of them and uh, we're just looking forward to what God is going to do uh, on this day amen um, Alphys if you can just do me uh, the favor of uh, the beginning of the first Sabbath of each month you know at the beginning of the year the month of January we went over each Sabbath uh, our new mission statement and motto but just because I'm aware of how our memories sometimes work. Amen? We want to just be consistent. Uh, and so the first Sabbath of each month, we want to just, again, just recite our mission statement and motto so that uh, everyone can know who we are, why we exist, and we can share that message with others. Amen? And so you can see it on the screen. Come on, repeat after me our mission statement. The Community uh, Worship Center, SDA, uh, an environment. Receive God's word for guidance. Connect through relationship. Share God through outreach. And experience God through worship. We put it together, our motto, let's grow together. Each of those key words, guidance, relationship, outreach, and worship are bold and highlighted because the first letters of each of those words is an acronym, GROW. And our motto, we simplify, let's grow together. That's what is all said and done. We are a body of believers. God has put us together for the simple purpose of growing together as we prepare for his kingdom. How many you believe that today? So again, uh, we exist to receive God's word for guidance connect through relationships, share God through outreach, and experience God through worship. Somebody say amen. So if I come and quiz you, how many will pass? Somebody being honest said, I don't know, Pastor. <laughs> That's all right, but let's, we, we want to learn that. Uh, we can brand that so that uh, when you meet people on the bus or on a train and they want to know about your church, you can simply just tell them what our mission and motto is. This is who we are. Amen? Amen. So we're going to do that on the first Sabbath of each month. Amen? Amen. I do want to just highlight just a couple things as we get ready to get in God's word. On next Sabbath, uh, it was mentioned earlier, and I hope as many of you as possible will support our youth compassion team uh, for the outreach initiative that will be taking place immediately after service, uh, going out into community, trying to impact and make a difference. Amen? Amen. And then on next Sunday, that's March the 12th at 10 a.m. What time did I say? Uh, is our parenting class. Uh, is, you know, a lot of parents are struggling today. Um, there's just a lot of different issues and things going on. And so Dr. Woods is going to be here with us leading out in a parenting class on March, 10, on, on March 12th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, brunch will be provided on that day and what we're asking for everyone there are flyers that are at the podium as you leave today if you would take a flyer with you if you would just scan the barcode because we're asking everyone to register you can scan the barcode to register or you can head up to our website at cwcsda.org or you can email familylife at cwcsda.org uh, to register or just speak directly with Natalie or Kevin Williams, our family life uh, directors, 
or uh, Elder Ravon Scott Channer, who's our education director, because most ministries are partnering together for this parenting class. Amen? Amen. So please, brothers and sisters, take advantage of what will be offered for you on next Saturday, on next Sabbath, and on Sunday. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, we want to go to the God, to the word of God at this time. I do want to just acknowledge as well. We praise God. I thank God for blessing my wife uh, with another year of life. She celebrated her birthday on this past Wednesday. Amen. Amen. So if you see her, I just wish her a happy birthday. Uh, we thank God for just another year of life, of health, of uh, no pregnancy. These last couple of years been pregnant on a birthday, so we just uh, we just celebrating the fact that there is no pregnancy this year. Amen. Amen. We praise God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But if you see her, she's all, most of the time she's in the back in the office with the babies. Uh, but please, um, just just wish her happy birthday uh, to the first lady. Amen. Amen. And I believe I was told as well, Sister Chase. I hear Sister Chase is back. Sister Chase, you back? Where's Sister Chase? Sister Chase, welcome. Welcome back. Welcome back home. Amen. Sister Chase is back from her original home, back home in New York. Amen. And so we welcome you back again. And I believe Sister Chase had a birthday uh, as well. And so we uh, thank God for blessing you uh, as you went home. So today. Oh, Sister Chase's birthday is today. Happy birthday, Sister Chase. Amen. And so we thank God that God brought you back safely. And I believe we'll be celebrating um, their birthdays downstairs uh, during the lunch hour. Uh, so let's stand now, brothers and sisters, as we go to the book of Jonah. What book did I say? The book of Jonah, chapter 4. What chapter did I say? Chapter 4. And we'll read in your hearing verses... 10 and 11. That's the book of Jonah, chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. When you have it, say amen. amen. And the word of God says, Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night, and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. And watch this. And also much cattle. Uh, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord at this time. So we consider for the next few moments, why Jonah? Why Jonah? Bow your heads now. Father, speak to us now like only you can. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. The church said amen and amen. Why Jonah? In the late winter of the year 1891, the whale ship, the Star of the East, was in the area of the Falkland Islands when it sighted a whale. Two boats were sent out with harpoons to catch and kill the creature. But the whale's lashing tail overturned one of the boats spilling the crew into the sea. All were finally rescued back on board the other ship, all except for one sailor named James Bartley. The whale was eventually killed and its body pulled aboard the ship to begin the process of stripping its valuable resources. By the next day, good progress had been made in removing the layers of blubber. So a tackle was attached to its stomach to hoist it on deck. The sailors were startled by what appeared to be signs 
of life inside the stomach lining. Cutting the well open, the sailors found the missing James Bartley. Bartley was quite insane for two weeks, uh, but when he recovered his senses, uh, he told what he remembered of being dragged under the water. While struggling for his life, he had been drawn into darkness and felt a terrible and oppressive heat. Reaching out his hand, uh, he felt slimy walls that gave slightly to his touch. But he could not find an exit. When it finally dawned on him what most likely happened, he lost his senses and lapsed into a catatonic state. During his time inside the well, Bartley's face, neck, and hands bleached deathly white by gastric juices, and the texture of his skin was like parchment. He never recovered from this effect. Bartley, however, believed that he would have likely lived inside the well until he starved to death as he did not find breathing a problem. What a great and interesting story. But is it true? Reports suggest that this well story is nothing more than an early urban legend. But brothers and sisters, whether it's true or not, we know that there has been at least one individual in the world who has truly gone through such an amazing experience and lived to tell about it. This man's name is Jonah. We want to look at his story today. This story is such an interesting story because within this story, we see elements of how Jonah relates to the church. We see God moving and overriding events. Uh, we see how sometimes it takes us uh, hitting rock bottom uh, before we finally look up. Uh, so it's a story, brothers and sisters, that I believe uh, can relate to each and every one of us uh, in some way, shape, or form. It's a very familiar story, and uh, I'm certain that most of us, uh, if not all of us, have heard it before. Uh, and as I've been thinking about it lately, uh, I find myself continuing uh, to get stuck and hung up on the very same question, and that is, why Jonah? We know the story. God was about to send judgment upon the Ninevites. Because as verse 2 of chapter 1 says, uh, their wickedness is come up before me. In other words, their sins were so great that God could no longer stand by uh, and do nothing about it. Uh, so in, an, in, uh, in a last act of mercy, uh, he sends them a final warning message uh, that judgment is coming. And Jonah was the chosen vessel uh, to send uh, this final warning message. So I find myself asking, why Jonah? We know how the story goes. Uh, he did not want to go. As a matter of fact, he even tried uh, to run away. I'm almost certain that uh, he wasn't the only prophet uh, or servant of God uh, available. I'm reminded of Elijah when he cried uh, unto God uh, complaining that he was all alone, uh, that he was the only one left, uh, but God responded and informed Elijah uh, that he had 7,000 uh, that had never bowed or worshipped uh, a false god, uh, but they were loyal and dedicated uh, to him alone. Uh, so I say again, why Jonah? When I think about the fact that uh, Nineveh was, hear me now, was uh, 500 miles away from where Jonah was. 
and their mode of transportation uh, there were no cars uh, there was no taxi or, or, or Uber or Lyft service uh, there were no planes to fly uh, but they were on foot or at best on the back of an animal uh, or, or a ship if they traveled by sea uh, you mean to tell me that within those 500 miles uh, there wasn't another servant of God uh, who was closer and more willing uh, to relay God's final warning message to the Ninevites so I ask again why Jonah have you ever wondered why Jonah so brothers and sisters I invite you to take this journey with me today as we watch how God moves and how he works as we begin to discover and see exactly why God chose Jonah you see, there are four. How many did I say? There are four areas we're going to look at today that will guide us throughout the rest of this message. First, we will look at Jonah's predicament. Then we'll see God's provision, followed by Jonah's promise, and lastly, God's purpose. You see, brothers and first, brothers and sisters, first we see Jonah's predicament. You see, we all know what the highlight of this whole story is. That is Jonah ending up in the belly of a giant fish for three days. Well, the question is, how did he get there? Well, God called his servant Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh to deliver his final warning message that judgment was coming upon the people of that city because of their wickedness. Jonah, however, disobeys God by refusing to go to Nineveh. As a matter of fact, not only does he not go to Nineveh, but he tries to run in the total opposite direction. Verse 3 says, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. Isn't it amazing how uh, sin and disobedience uh, automatically cause us to want to run away from God? Adam and Eve walked and talked with God in the Garden of Eden until the day that they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And immediately after that, when God came looking for them, the same two who walked and talked with God in the garden, but now they are trying to hide from him, sin and disobedience automatically cause us to want to run away and hide from God. God watch this Nineveh was 500 miles northeast of Jonah but he decides to go 2,000 miles west to Tarshish to run from the Lord so he runs and boards a ship heading in the opposite direction but while sailing away God begins to move by sending a great wind into the sea that caused a mighty storm so much so that the men on board the ship feared for their lives so the men because of their fear all begin to cry out unto their gods and they begin to throw the cargo overboard to try and lighten the load of the ship all of them did this but yet nothing got better and well that is all of them except for Jonah because in the midst of all of this he is sleeping through the storm and let me just park on the side of the road for a moment uh, and throw this in here listen brothers and sisters uh, their need was so great uh, that the men despaired uh, for their lives uh, trying to do anything to survive uh, yet God's servant slept what an object lesson to God's people then and now uh, to awaken uh, from apathy uh, as crying people uh, perish on the sea of life you see, too many of us uh, as God's servants are sleeping. Uh, yeah, we come to church every Sabbath, uh, but that's about it. Uh, we're sleeping uh, and all the while uh, a crying people, uh, a crying community, uh, a crying city uh, is perishing uh, all around us on the sea of life. 
So the shipmaster now goes down to Jonah to try and figure out how in the midst of this storm where everybody else is fearing for their life but this brother is sleeping. So he wakes Jonah and says call upon your God. See all the other gods had failed. Call upon your God to see if he can do something about this storm. They even decided to cast lots, uh, which was a common practice uh, in Israel and other countries uh, in the ancient Near East. Uh, during that time, they tried to figure out uh, who is the cause of this storm uh, because everything else they have tried uh, has failed. Uh, and as God would have it, uh, the lot fell to Jonah. And watch this now. Uh, Jonah publicly acknowledges that he is the cause of this storm because he serves the God who made the sea and the dry land but he acknowledges the fact that he has disobeyed his God and in fact is on the run from him and this is the cause of the storm. He then asked the men to cast him overboard that the storm might cease. Jonah, who is the servant of the Lord, yet his hatred for the Ninevites is so strong that he would rather die than go give them a final warning message from God that may cause them to repent and be saved. He would rather be lost than see them saved. Angry, but reluctant to throw Jonah overboard, the men begin to row harder to try and reach land, but it was all for naught because the storm was just too powerful. So they finally gave themselves up to the reality that they must throw him overboard, but they cried out to God that his blood be not held upon them because it was Jonah who sinned and it was God God who brought about the storm so they threw Jonah down into the sea and verse 17 says that the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights let's recap what has happened Jonah decided to go against God's plan God's will he decides uh, to disobey what God has called him to do, brothers and sisters, and watch the sequence. After he disobeyed, uh, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. Uh, he then boarded the ship uh, and went down into the bottom of it. Uh, then a little while later, he was thrown overboard uh, and went down into the sea uh, just to then be swallowed up uh, by a giant fish uh, and go down into the belly of that prepared fish uh, which took him down uh, into the depths of the sea. Uh, understand today uh, that the consequences of his backsliding uh, was downward. Uh, what what am I trying to say uh, from the moment he decided to backslide uh, everything went down and let this be a lesson to us today uh, as we look at Jonah's predicament uh, and that is uh, that things don't get better uh, things don't work out for our good uh, things don't go up uh, when we choose to do wrong uh, but on the contrary they end up going down Listen, church, in the grand scheme of things, when I look over my life in its totality, sin has brought me more misery and pain than joy and happiness. As a matter of fact, I forfeited my joy and happiness and brought upon myself pain and misery when I chose to do wrong. 
You see, Jonah is in this predicament now uh, where he's somewhere in the middle of the sea, uh, stuck in the belly uh, of a great giant fish, uh, doesn't know if he's going to survive. Uh, he doesn't know if he will ever get out. Uh, he doesn't know if he'll ever see the light of day again. Uh, and it's all because of his own doing. You see, some of us are dealing with financial issues now because when God blessed us, we blew it. Some of our relationships are jacked up because we moved on our own. Some of us have health challenges and issues that we are dealing with now all because of choices we made where we disregarded our bodies as the temple of the Holy Ghost. What am I trying to say here? God gets too much of the blame for our bad predicaments in life when in reality, nine times out of ten, they are self-inflicted. Jonah is in this predicament because he chose to do wrong. But watch this now. Even when he chose to do wrong, and even when we choose to do wrong, and even when we falsely accuse and blame God for our own self-inflicted predicaments, yet he's still there. He doesn't turn his back on us, but is still working to deliver us and turn us around, yea, even save us, and we find it here in this story. See, not only do we see Jonah's predicament, but we also see God's provision. Brother and sister, isn't it amazing how when you're doing wrong, and you know you're doing wrong, yet God still provides. He still watches over us. He still makes provisions. You know, perspective, what's the word I said? You know, perspective is a powerful thing for some people the thought of being inside the belly of a great fish pretty much sums up the fact that things can't get much worse than this or better yet could anything worse ever happen but understand today that God preparing a great fish uh, and I will be the first to admit uh, that I don't know how he did it uh, was there already a fish big enough uh, that could swallow a whole a human whole uh, or did God create a great fish uh, for this specific occasion uh, I don't know uh, but what I do know uh, is that it was an act of God's mercy you see, I told you perspective is a powerful thing. And had it not been for the great fish, Jonah would have died because he would have drowned. Even if he could swim, uh, yet the likelihood uh, of him being able to swim uh, to shore was uh, highly unlikely uh, because he was in the middle of the sea uh, and there were other violent fish in the water. Uh, so God's uh, act of preparing uh, a great fish uh, to swallow Jonah alive uh, was an act of mercy. Uh, it was God's provision uh, to spare and save his life life uh, even though at that time uh, he was openly disobeying God but God in his sovereignty began to move in this situation because God knew that this is what was what it was going to take to get Jonah back on the right track. Uh, you see, sometimes, brothers and sisters, uh, God has to allow us to fall down uh, to our lowest point. Uh, he has to allow us to hit rock bottom uh, because that is what it will take for us to finally look up. You see, this is what happened to Jonah. Uh, this is what happened in Jonah's case. Uh, he hit his low point. Uh, I'm stuck here uh, in the belly uh, of this great fish uh, and I don't know uh, whether I'm going to live or die. Uh, he hit rock bottom, uh, but this is what it took to get his attention. Uh, we find it right here in the word. Immediate, immediately in chapter 2, the very first, first, first verse says, 
Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Then in verse 7 he says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. <laughs> and my prayers came in unto thee, into thine own, into thine holy temple. <laughs> when his soul fainted, when he was at his weakest, when he couldn't go any further, that's when it says he remembered God. He had hit rock bottom. And let me just say this, I know life gets rough sometimes sometimes it can seem and feel uh, overwhelming uh, but i'm so thankful today uh, that i serve a god who loves me enough uh, that every now and then uh, he will allow me to hit rock bottom uh, i'm glad that he uh, moves and orchestrates events uh, that will take me down to a place uh, where the only thing i can do is look up uh, i'm so glad that he loves me enough uh, that he will allow me to go down uh, just because he's trying to reach me you see sometimes brothers and sisters and we're all guilty of it uh, but sometimes we in the name of loving people uh, we try to overprotect them uh, from certain things uh, we try to keep them from hitting rock bottom uh, and it's understandable because uh, who really wants to see their child or grandchild uh, brother or sister hit rock bottom but truth of the matter today is that every now and then, uh, it's the best thing that could happen to us. Uh, as a matter of fact, God, uh, who is our Father, uh, every now and then allows us, uh, he allows it to happen, uh, not because he's trying to destroy us, uh, but because he's trying to save us. Jonah understood this uh, that's why at rock bottom uh, in the belly of the great fish uh, he started praying uh, and Jonah he had the right perspective uh, he understood that God uh, was doing all of this uh, because he was trying to save him this is why in his prayer in chapter 2 verse 6 uh, Jonah cries uh, yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption <laughs> oh lord my god that word corruption here uh, is speaking of death uh, you see jonah understands the fact uh, that he should have died uh, and could have died uh, being overthrown uh, uh, overthrown overboard uh, had it not been for the grace and mercy of god uh, preparing a great fish to swallow him alive uh, he understood that god uh, was sparing his life uh, there at rock bottom uh, he recognized that God uh, had not turned his back on him uh, that God uh, was still in charge uh, that God uh, was still working and it working uh, and it was there that he stopped running from God uh, and began praying to him listen brothers and sisters if it's going to take some of my loved ones to have to hit rock bottom to cause them to stop running from God I'm all for it if I gotta hit rock bottom then so be it Lord just save me is that anybody's prayer today and hear me now Jonah began to recognize God's provision and it led him to begin to make a change though not a complete change yet it prompts Jonah to make a promise to God let's look at Jonah's promise look at what verse 9 of chapter 2 says but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving I will pay that that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord here again we see Jonah acknowledging the fact that he gets it he recognizes the fact that God provided for him that God spared his life in the midst of his running from God in the midst of his disobedience yet God still provided for him as a result now he basically is saying in verse 9 that he vows to obey the Lord because salvation or deliverance comes from the Lord 
So Jonah is saying, God, I recognize your grace and mercy. I know salvation and deliverance comes from you. Thank you for sparing my life. I get it now, and I'm going to go and do what you have called me to do. I will go to Nineveh. And watch this now. Verse 10 says, got to get this. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. In other words, that's all the Lord wanted in the first place. Jonah was only in the belly of the fish long enough until he learned the lesson. The fact that some of us year after year are still stuck in the same mess is not an indictment on God but an indictment upon ourselves. How much needless stuff we go through if we just follow the Lord from the start. I'm talking about less sleepless nights, less stress, less pain, less sorrow, less burdens, less guilt, less shame, less problems, less issues, less drama if we just follow from the start. If I were to ask us all if we think that God knows what's best for us, I'm almost certain that every one of us would raise our hands and say yes. Well, if that's the case, why not follow him from the start? Life would be so much easier. Jonah, when he finally got it, makes a promise to God while still in the belly of the great fish that he would be obedient. God commands the fish to let him go. This leads us to our last point. Now we'll see God's purpose. Chapter 3 verse 1 says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Y'all missed it. Let me read that again. Chapter 3 verse 1 says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. That's your shouting moment. You see, Jonah had disobeyed God's command. And in the book of Jonah, out of all the people and things mentioned in the book, I'm talking about the storm, uh, the casting of lots, uh, the sailors, the fish, uh, the Ninevites, the plant, uh, the worm, and the east wind, uh, they all obeyed the command of God, uh, all except the prophet Jonah himself. Uh, but in spite of his disobedience, uh, the fact that the word of the Lord uh, still came to him a second time uh, reminds us of the fact uh, that the God we serve is the God of a second chance. Some of us know if it had not been for God uh, giving us another chance, uh, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, we wouldn't be alive today. Uh, we wouldn't be saved, sanctified, uh, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, some of us understand uh, that the reason why we don't look like what we've been through uh, is because God has given us another chance. So the word of the Lord tells Jonah a second time to go to Nineveh and preach unto it the words that I give you. So Jonah goes and does what God has commanded him to do. And he cries out in Nineveh and says, yet 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. Verse 5 of chapter 3 says, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth, 
from the greatest of them even to the least of them word even spread to the king of Nineveh who then laid aside his robe and covered himself in sackcloth and sat in ashes he made a public decree that everyone should fast that not even beast or flock eat they didn't even feed the animals he commanded that everyone pray unto God and turn from their evil ways and let go of the violence that was in their hands. Verse 10 of chapter 3 then says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So in essence, God saw their change. And as a result, God changed his mind and decided that he would not destroy them. End of the story. We all go home happy, right? No. Because then comes chapter 4. Now we begin to see why Jonah. Verse 1 of chapter 4 says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. Jonah begins to even pray to God and complain to him. You see, God, this is why I tried to run to Tarshish. This is why I didn't want to go in the first place. For he says in verse 2, for I know that thou art a gracious God. Come on, what a testimony. And merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. In other words, he's saying, God, I know you're a forgiving God, and I knew you might change your mind and save them if they repented. You see, brothers and sisters, what we have to understand uh, as we are discovering why Jonah is that this book is just as much about God uh, trying to save Jonah as it is about him trying to save the Ninevites. You see, God knew his servant Jonah and he knew how Jonah felt about the Ninevites. You see, Nineveh was well known for the brutal atrocities it inflicted on its war captives. It was also known for its idolatry. And Jonah's probably also aware of the fact based upon the words of Amos and Hosea that one day Assyria would be Israel's destroyer, at least of the northern kingdom. So all of this added to his hatred for them and he did not want them to be saved and what's really sad about this commentary is the fact that Jonah who God had just given a second chance he was an object of God's compassion but yet he had no compassion for the people of Nineveh but guess what, brothers and sisters? Uh, the unfortunate reality today uh, is that you have the same problem uh, in the church uh, when you see people uh, who are guilty of the same sin uh, but yet have no compassion uh, on someone else. Oh, what am I talking about? You had a child out of wedlock uh, 40 years ago uh, and nobody remembers it, uh, but you want to now throw the book uh, at some young lady today uh, for the same sin. God forgave you, uh, but you don't want to forgive anybody. Uh, you used to drink. Uh, you used to dabble in drugs and all kind of filth. Uh, but you're here now, uh, saved in the church. Uh, but you now don't want to be welcoming uh, to somebody in the church uh, who has the same addiction problem uh, you used to have. Jonah had just been forgiven by God and given a second chance uh, and just a few days later when God extended uh, his same forgiveness to the Ninevites uh, he has the nerve uh, to be angry about it Jonah a believer is so angry 
he's so angry about this thing that he even begins to cry out that it will be better for him to die. Again, he would rather die than see them saved. So God is like, let me go ahead and deal with this brother right here. So watch what God does. First, God asks him, is his anger justified? But he was so angry that he did not respond. He ignored God. So, so we've done it too. We all living on grace and mercy. He retreats outside the city to wait and see what was going to happen to the city and would God follow through with his destruction. As Jonah sat under the booth he made, God prepared a gourd that would sprout up and be a covering over Jonah's head that would give him some shade. And Jonah was exceedingly glad, the Bible says, but then on the next morning, God prepared a war worm that destroyed the gourd. And then when the sun rose, God prepared a hot and dry wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head that was so bothersome that Jonah wished himself again to die. So God says to Jonah again, is your anger justified this time for the gourd? But this time Jonah responds about the gourd and says that he has a right to be angry, even to death. Watch God's response. Verse 10 and 11. Thou hast had pity on the gourd. For which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. And God was not only concerned about them, and he says, and also much cattle. God wanted Jonah to see the contrast between his sparing Nineveh and his destroying the vine. The contrast between Jonah's lack of concern for the spiritual welfare of the Ninevites and his concern for his own physical welfare. You see, both Jonah's unconcern for Nineveh and his concern for himself were both selfish. You see, his concern was dictated by self-interest, not genuine love. You see, God was trying to reach and to save Jonah because his heart was not right and Jonah represented Israel and in a lot of ways, he represents the church today who in a lot of ways care more for earthly comforts than for the interests of God's will among men. You see, we need to realize uh, that as we understand uh, how this book represents us today, uh, that it should remind us as Christians uh, that God actually does really love everyone. Even the people who don't look like us and haven't spent their lives like many of us, uh, especially those of us who grew up in the church. As one writer puts it, this book of Jonah is written to good people. It's a warning that those of us who are willing to spend our lives serving the Lord can also be the most prone to forget the very nature of the Lord. 
after years and years of service, we start to forget just how much we need God. And we find ourselves just like Jonah, sitting in our safety zone, looking down on the sinful city, a place desperately in need of God, yet complaining when we lose a creature comfort. Jonah could be angry because a gourd was destroyed that covered him and gave him shade, but at the same time be as equally angry because God did not destroy the Ninevites. And God wanted Jonah to see that he had no right to be angry over Nineveh or the vine because Jonah did not give life to or sustain either one of them. Nor was he sovereign over them. See, Jonah, you think you have the right to be upset. But understand, you never had the devotion of a gardener. The gourd came up today. And it's gone tomorrow. If you think you feel as you do, what would you expect the gardener to feel like? Who tended a plant and watched it grow, only to see it wither and die. Jonah, this is how I feel about Nineveh, only much more so. All those people and all those animals, I made them. I have cherished them all these years. Nineveh has cost me no, uh, no end of effort and it means the world to me. Your pain is nothing compared to mine when I contemplate their destruction. And brothers and sisters, I'm through, but I'm so glad that I serve a God. God who is a gracious God. A God who's a merciful God. A God who's slow to anger. And a God of great kindness. Jeremiah says it's because of his mercies that we are not consumed. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Even when we don't deserve it, God is still faithful. He wanted to save Jonah just as much as he tried to save the Ninevites. And I'm so glad, brothers and sisters, that he's a God who wants to save everybody. He even orchestrates events uh, just to save sinners like me. He created a storm uh, and he prepared a great fish uh, all because uh, he wanted to save Jonah. He's a sovereign God who's got all power in the palm of his hands. Uh, I'll say it again, he even orchestrates events. Uh, when Pharaoh wouldn't let his people go, uh, God orchestrated events. Uh, when the three Hebrew boys were in the fiery furnace, uh, God orchestrated events. Uh, when Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, uh, God orchestrated events. Uh, what Joseph's brothers meant for evil, uh, God meant it for good uh, because he orchestrates events. <laughs> when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, uh, they deserved to die. <laughs> But God made them a promise because he orchestrates events. And 2,000 years ago, on a hill called Calvary, he orchestrated his greatest event when his son Jesus Christ hung, bled, and died for your sins and for mine. But because he orchestrates events, he did not stay dead because bright and early three days later on Sunday morning he got up I said he got up is there anybody glad that he got up with all power in his hands because he orchestrates events because he's trying to save everybody that's why the songwriter said I heard a joyful sound Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Uh, spread the tidings, spread them all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Uh, to the utmost, Jesus saves. Uh, he will pick you up and turn you around. Hallelujah. 
Jesus saves. Do you know him? Because he still saves. He's God's son. He's a sinner savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands in the solitude of himself. He's awesome. He's unique. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him because he's incomparable. He's incombustible. He's incomprehensible. He's indefensible. He's indescribable. He's in, uh, he is indestructible. And he's infallible. He's invaluable. And he's invincible. But best of all, he's my friend. Do you have a friend in Jesus that sticks closer than any brother? Hallelujah in this place. Why Jonah? I got a better question. Why me? Why you? Any sermon I preach, any Bible study I give, any good you do for the church, brothers and sisters, understand any calling that God has placed on your life is all because while he's using you to help and to try to reach others he's at the same time trying to reach me trying to reach you and we never get to a place where we've arrived to the point where we no longer no, no longer need God to still reach out to us Jonah thought he had arrived to a place where now he can pick and choose or help determine who's worthy of God's grace who's worthy of God's salvation but it's because he had gotten to a place while he was still operating for God he was no longer connected and a fear that we have to make sure for each of us today is that we've not been in this thing so long that we've gotten to the place that we're only operating off of what we know not because of who we know operating off of what we've done not because of what's being done in us anybody hearing me and that's why it's always disappointing to me in church when we talk of evangelism and doing ministry and reaching the lost that so many of us don't want to be involved or don't see the necessity of it and it's so sad because we don't realize that God needs you to be involved because through the process of reaching others he's still reaching you he's still refining me it, this makes sense
And so as our motto says, let's grow together. One of the ways that we can effectively do that is when we all stay committed to doing the work of ministry. When we all stay committed to loving the least of the us. When we all keep fresh in our minds that as it was on the first day when I first believed that even now God is still just as much trying to save me as he was back then and so as we bring this time together to a close At this time of appeal, can we make a commitment based on the understanding of the fact that whatever God has called me to do, whatever gifts he has given me to use for the kingdom of God, the sole purpose is because he is, while I am being used to reach others, he is still reaching me. Can we as a body of believers today make the commitment from this day forward? And I need you to make, you can't make this appeal individually, collectively, but I need each of us to think and make this appeal individually. think about yourself now that you're going to make the commitment that I'm no longer going to stand on the sideline I'm not just going to come to church and that be it but whatever God has for me to do I'm going to do my part through the strength and power of God. If that's you, I want you to stand with me now. Whoever you are, just stand now. You're standing saying, I'm making a commitment that I want to be involved. That I know that God has something for me to do. That I don't want to be like Jonah. And get so self-consumed in myself. That I'm unwilling to help. Those who God has called and entrusted me. To make a difference in their life. Brothers and sisters, I'm a firm believer. I've seen it over and over again. That when we make ourselves willing to be vessels used by God, we don't even have to go out of our own way. God has ordained. God has placed people in our paths. Could be a co-worker. Could be somebody you ride, you see each other on the bus every day, on the train. Could be somebody you end up working out with at the gym every day. But God has allowed your paths to continue the cross because God is trying to use you to reach that person. And in the process, he's continuing to reach you. I thank you on this day that you're standing saying, God, I want to recommit myself to be involved in the work of ministry, to continue staying connected to you and being used for the kingdom of God as you're continuing to work on me. Before we pray, there's someone else here. 
there's some who are standing now because you just needed to make a recommitment. But there is someone here today. You need to make a first time commitment. Maybe you're like Jonah. And a word is speaking to you a second time. Or a third time or a fourth time. Maybe for you, you need to just come back all together. You walked away from God. As you saw the pool. And if there have been souls who've gone down into the watery grave of baptism on this day. Next time, that can be you. Jesus has been calling you. He's been touching you. He's been speaking to you. You needed this message to know. Because you felt like a Ninevite. You felt like your life has been so bad, that you've been so unworthy, that you've been so ungood, that God does not still love you, that God does not want to save you, that God just wants to destroy you. But just like the Ninevites, God wants to save everyone. Just repent and believe. There's space for you in the kingdom. Why don't you come home today? You're here, we have elders who are stationed throughout the sanctuary. They have a card for you to fill out. Whoever you are, I know you're here, just raise that hand. There's room for you. We want you to join God's family today and become a member of this body today. As you say yes to Jesus, who are you? Who will take that step? As we're walking down the aisle to take steps toward you, as Jesus is standing with his hands wide open, as he took steps for you walking to the cross. The only step I'm asking you to take right now, just raise that hand. And we'll be with you. Just raise it. Whether you're young or old, just raise it now before we pray. Whoever you are, now is your time. God is calling you, whoever you are, just raise that hand. Just raise it nice and high so we can see you. Just raise it. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, God. Because there's no one like you we thank you God for as we ask the question why Jonah the same question could be asked about each and every one of us but we thank you for your grace we thank you for your mercy the fact that you love us unconditionally that there's nothing that we could ever do that would cause you to stop loving us we thank you for how you've continued to nurture and build and grow us. And Father, right now, we thank you for those who have stood in an act of recommitment, saying, God, they understand the fact that you have called all of us to be evangelists and to do the work of ministry. And the fact that God, it's vitally important because while you're using us to reach others, you're in fact still reaching us and saving us. We thank you, God, for your saving grace. And I pray even right now for those who have made this recommitment, God, that you would begin, your spirit now would touch and open their eyes. That they will begin to see and recognize souls that you have placed in their sphere of influence that you're trying to reach for the kingdom through them God may many run here with testimony sharing of how you have used them to bring others to Christ and in the process they have grown closer themselves is our prayer. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Just very, very quickly.
do want to um, meet very quickly at the conclusion of service. I want to meet with everyone between the age of 18 to 35. What age group did I say? 18 to 35. I have some, an announcement I need to share with you uh, immediately down front on this side at the conclusion of service. That's the age of 18 to 35. I have an opportunity I want to share with you. Very quickly before we uh, uh, close this service, I want to do the right hand of fellowship for our candidates who are baptized today. Uh, I want uh, Sister Riley to come as well, who uh, came in through profession of faith. I want to invite you all to come forward. Uh, I want uh, Russell. Russell, I want Russell to come down. We're going to officially... We need to... Yeah. And whose membership was transferred officially here. Where's Naya? I, saw, I think I saw her. Where is she? Oh, come. You as well. Come. And we want to extend the right hand of fellowship to all of our newest members. Amen. 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 So let's give us a little music. And I'm going to invite all of the officers, uh, all of the officers to come. And let's extend the right hand of fellowship at this time. Yeah, let's move. Yeah, officers, let's go. Come.
Amen. And I want to... I want to as well acknowledge Sister Myrtle Joseph. Uh, you didn't hear me say her name. I did not know she was here. I didn't see her today, but she was well as baptized in one of our last baptisms. And we we're glad to be able to extend the right hand of fellowship to you as well today. Blessings. Amen. When the roll is called up yonder, shall we stand? of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.
You may be seated for a moment of meditation. Thank you.